Hi, I'm Brennan Smith, and I'm talking to you about our work on restoring hydrologic function of urban soils. I'm going to talk about disturbed urban soils and methods of restoring their hydrologic function, and present data from our study sites in Baltimore City and Southern Maryland that speak to the potential of these techniques as tools for the design of superior sustainable landscapes. Land development practices can result in highly disturbed, compacted urban soils, but different styles of development will disturb the soil profile in different ways, uh, you know, to different degrees and different spatial extents. On the left, we'll see a custom single-family home where only the foundation footprint of the house is being disturbed. And you can see the uh, intact soil profile surrounding the foundation. On the right is a new development going in, and notice the wholesale removal of topsoil and the compaction of the subgrade across the entire site. Where this mass grading is standard construction practice, it's very common, and by design it results in disturbed soils with severely diminished hydrologic function. However, this is that same neighborhood from the previous slide several years later, and it looks green and healthy, but we fully expect reduced hydrologic function based on our knowledge of the development process. And this is a key point that you can't infer the function of a site or landscape from its form or its appearance. So what we're investigating are these incremental changes to the land development and construction processes that can help to restore or retain the hydrologic function of the developed landscape. And the main practice we're looking at is called suburban subsoiling. Uh, we've adapted these agricultural techniques of decompaction and amendment to apply them to the urban environment. Decompaction is achieved through deep bladed ripping and compost amendment through tilling or spading. And we were able to implement these techniques on our study site in Baltimore City, Yorkwood Elementary School. This is a public school in northeast Baltimore that was removing its asphalt playground, as you can see in the before and after photos. And we found this site particularly interesting because stormwater credits are issued for the removal of impervious area without any investigation into the resulting change in hydrologic function. So this was a great opportunity for us to partner with Bill Stack and the City of Baltimore to demonstrate our soil decompaction and amendment techniques to restore the hydrologic function to this schoolyard. Uh, the area outlined in red received the city standard specification for topsoiling while the area outlined in green received our suburban subsoiling treatment. And this baseball field to the north was never paved over and left relatively undisturbed, mm -hmm. so we used it as a reference condition to compare to other fields. And we implemented suburban subsoiling on this site through deep ripping and compost amendment. Uh, you can see on the left our ripper has five blades about 20 inches deep to break up the soil and decompact it and then we spread three inches of compost over the entire site and tried to incorporate it to a depth of nine inches for a two to one soil to compost ratio. And the goal here is a restored ecosystem with a deep rooted drought resistant turf growing in a deep healthy active soil profile with restored hydrologic function. And we saw some evidence that this was working right away. Um, before we could collect samples or even establish turf, a storm event that was approximately a 10-year storm gave us our first data point less than a month after treatment. Uh, the field that received suburban subsoiling has no standing water or evidence of runoff or rills, while the field that received standard topsoiling uh, tells a very different story. And it's interesting that the, the puddles and the standing water here, they seem to be in the shape of the tracks of the vehicle that spread the topsoil, which means that even before this field got seeded, uh, it was compacted just by design from the heavy equipment on it. So once turf was established, uh, it told a clear story as well. And here's how these fields look two years after treatment. Um, notice how the turf cover for the standard topsoiling is pretty spotty and it's dominated by clover and crabgrass. And the soil profile here shows a very thin organic layer underlain by this compacted, structureless sandy loam. Uh, in contrast, our suburban subsoiling resulted in this very dense, thick, vigorous turf cover that could outcompete the clover and a more structured soil profile with a much greater depth of organic matter. And it's important to note here that neither field uh, receives any fertilizer or irrigation input. So our suburban subsoiling results in this more resilient, drought-resistant turf that's a superior landscaping practice where the cost savings from reduced irrigation and fertilizer inputs can more than offset the incrementally higher upfront cost of doing this treatment compared to standard topsoiling. And on top of that, we're providing hydrologic services for the Chesapeake Bay, so it's really a win-win. 
Um, and the advantages and the differences in turf cover are also reflected in other uh, more quantitative soil physical properties. Uh, this is a compaction surface. I used a GPS referenced logging penetrometer to collect a cone index survey, where cone index is a measure of soil strength, and it's really a surrogate for compaction. Um, and plant roots can't really penetrate beyond 300 psi, which corresponds to yellow in this color scheme. And the field that received suburban subsoiling, you'll notice, is almost entirely below 300 psi, except for this hot spot in the bottom where the access point was. Uh, while the standard topsoiling treatment is almost entirely above 300 psi, suggesting that plant roots will have difficulty penetrating the soil profile in that field. And this pattern we see in other soil properties, too. Here I'm comparing long-term median values for soil properties of bulk density, organic matter, and infiltration. And we also see the mean soil moisture value from each field for a single survey event in March, which we're interpreting as the moisture available for the plants and the turf growing on the fields. So from left to right, each plot shows suburban subsoiling, standard topsoiling, and our reference control field. And we see a consistent pattern in the relationship between our suburban subsoiling field and the standard topsoiling field. Um, our treatment resulted in lower bulk density, higher organic matter, it showed the highest infiltration, and it also showed the highest level of plant available water in the soil profile. Whereas the standard topsoiling, it showed dense soil with low infiltration, low organic matter, and not nearly as much water available for the turf. So we're thrilled to see such clear results in the first three years, but it's still really important for us to understand the long-term performance of these practices, especially if we want to implement suburban subsoiling as a stormwater management BMP. So the organic matter from our compost amendment will be consumed by soil biota and it will degrade over time, and decompacted soil will gradually settle back to its native bulk density. And we need to better understand these processes to evaluate the longevity of this practice. Um, so this picture is from Trent Hill Nursery. It's in Southern Maryland, and it provided us with an excellent kind of opportunistic natural experiment to compare to our Yorkwood results. They perform soil decompaction and amendment on their planting rows uh, using a single-bladed ripper and a spader, which is similar to our equipment. But an important difference between the practice at Trent Hill and at the Yorkwood Elementary School is the absence of ground cover in the planting rows here at Trent Hill. You can see the bare soil in between the trees and shrubs. And so staggered treatment at Trent Hill allowed us to sample rows that had been treated at one year intervals from the current year up to seven years ago. And the data set from Trent Hill had some really interesting implications about the sustainability of our practices. Here I'm comparing organic matter levels in the soil over time from both Yorkwood and Trent Hill. And uh, years since treatment is moving forward on the x-axis. And you'll see that Trent Hill shows this clear exponential decay in organic matter. Uh, three years after treatment at Trent Hill, the initial supply of compost has declined to this steady, reduced level that's maintained all the way through year seven, past what I'm showing you in this particular plot. Uh, in contrast, our monitoring at Yorkwood shows that the organic matter is not only higher, but it's holding steady through year three. And although we see much more variation in the Yorkwood organic matter data, the key point is that we're seeing no evidence of this expected decay in organic matter that we saw at Trent Hill. And we see similar behavior in our infiltration plots as well. Uh, Trent Hill shows this decline in infiltration rate as the treatment ages. And the Yorkwood field is, again, it's highly variable, but without this clear trend or evidence of declining performance. And three years into our monitoring, we see infiltration rates holding steady at levels significantly higher than Trent Hill or on the standard topsoiling field at Yorkwood. So in contrast to the declining performance at Trent Hill, the persistence of function at Yorkwood suggests to us that there's this threshold intensity of our soil treatment practices that can result in a restored soil ecosystem process that can maintain a high functioning healthy soil profile over time. And so we think that there's this tipping point to sustainability where healthy soil with a high capacity for plant available nutrients and water can support a thick vigorous turf cover and this turf will put down new roots each year while the old, old roots decompose uh, returning organic matter to the soil profile and maintaining the soil structure. And the data at Yorkwood really supports this idea that aggressive treatment can jumpstart a healthy soil ecosystem with restored hydrologic function that will be maintained over time, even without fertilizer or irrigation inputs, and, there, and that there's this tipping point for restoring 
urban ecosystem function. And our data so far is showing that suburban subsoiling can provide strong results with very little maintenance. And we've shown that it works technically. And the incremental cost of this practice can be very low if it's properly staged and integrated into the grading and construction schedule. And these low incremental costs can be recovered quickly through reduced irrigation and fertilizer inputs, making this a superior sustainable landscaping practice that works economically as well. But more work is still needed to ensure that these practices could be institutionalized for stormwater credits. Uh, like all stormwater BMPs, we need to have supporting infrastructure for inspection, monitoring, and maintenance to assure that the hydrologic function is maintained over time and that the stormwater credit being issued is, is real. But we're, we're really excited to see this model for sustainability expanded and applied. So in conclusion, uh, standard construction practices commonly result in disturbed soil profiles with diminished hydrologic function by design, but our suburban subsoiling treatment can be very effective at restoring this hydrologic function to a disturbed soil profile. And our three years of data suggests that there's this threshold degree of treatment that results in a sustained urban ecosystem function, and we see broad potential for restoring the hydrologic and ecologic function to disturbed urban soils through this superior sustainable landscaping practice of suburban subsoiling. Thank you.